Hi everybody, Dr. Mike here. In this video, we're taking a look at excitable tissues. Now we need to first begin with the fact that there are four major tissue types of the body. So the body is made up of epithelial tissue, connective tissue, nervous tissue, and muscle tissue. And we need to think to ourselves of these four tissue types, which are excitable? Well, the question we have to ask before this is, what does excitable tissue mean? Now excitable tissue are tissues of the body that can either do nothing or be stimulated or excited to perform a function. And generally speaking, of those four tissue types, two fit that category. First of which is going to be nervous. So nervous tissue has the capacity to communicate. So either neurons don't send signals and nothing happens, or they fire off signals and something happens. And when they fire off, they fire off because they want to communicate. They are fast, they are direct. So they are there for communication. The other tissue type is the muscle tissue. And muscle tissue we know can do nothing and be relaxed, or it can be stimulated to contract. And if muscle tissue contracts, it performs some form of work. And that work is generally movement in some regard. So if we think about all the different muscle types, right? We know that we've got skeletal muscle. We know that we've got smooth muscle. We know that we have cardiac muscle. Now all of these are muscles that the fibers inside will contract. And when they contract, let's take skeletal muscle for example. This muscle tends to cross joints. So when it contracts and shortens, the joint moves, the skeleton moves. So skeletal muscle is therefore conscious movement of the skeleton. Smooth muscle, smooth muscle lines hollow organs. So it's inside of our blood vessels, our genitourinary tract. It's inside of our digestive system. And when this muscle contracts, it can either shorten the hollow tube that it's lining, or it can narrow the hollow tube that it's lining, and generally will help propel whatever substance is inside. And then cardiac muscle, this is the muscle that lines our heart. When it contracts, it squeezes blood, generates force, and therefore pushes blood and generates blood pressure. So we've got these two major tissue types that can do nothing or do something. So the question then is, what makes them excitable? Well, we need for, to first begin with just the general cell. If I were to just draw up a cell, and this cell is gonna be representative of both nervous and muscle tissue. So here I have a normal cell. And what we need to understand about the cell is that there are various channels and pumps inside of a cell, or at least lining the membrane of the cell. All right, so let's just take this first one. What we've got here is what we call a sodium potassium pump. What this pump does is it takes ATP that the body is generating, and it uses that energy to pump outside three sodium, one, two, three, and it exchanges it for two potassium. One, two. Now let's have a look at this. What is this sodium potassium pump doing? By throwing three sodium out, it's throwing not only a chemical outside and creating a chemical gradient where most sodium is outside, it's also creating a gradient where most potassium is inside. So one, the sodium potassium pump creates a chemical gradient where sodium's outside, potassium is inside. The other thing it does is it creates an electrical gradient because as you can see, the sodium has a positive charge associated with it and so does the potassium. Here we're throwing three positive things outside yet only two positive things inside. So if we were to check the charge difference of this cell, just across this membrane, you would see, well, the outside is slightly more positive compared to the inside. Or you could say that the inside is slightly more negative compared to the outside, simply because you've thrown more positive things outside. But what else happens in these excitable tissues is we don't just have a sodium potassium ATPase pump, we've also got some channels, some leaky channels. And in the case of neurons and most muscle, we've got what we call leaky potassium channels. Now what these leaky potassium channels have is their lid or their door is creaked open a little bit 
And because of the process of diffusion, where things like to go down their concentration gradient, so they go from an area where there's a lot of them to where there's not many of them to try and balance themselves out, this potassium will leak through the sodium potassium channel and leak outside. What do you think that means? It means it's carrying its positive charge with it, making the outside even more positive compared to the inside. What we've just generated through these two major channels, right, or at least a pump and a channel, is we've generated a charge difference across the membrane of both our nervous and muscle cells. If we were to measure that charge difference, it's going to be different between neurons and muscle cells. In actual fact, it can be different between different types of muscle cells and even different neurons. That's why I'm not going to give you a particular value. But what you do need to know is that the inside's negative compared to the positive, and at rest, we call this charge difference the resting membrane potential. The resting membrane potential. So this is excitable tissues at rest. They have a resting membrane potential where the inside is negative compared to the outside. Let's just quickly draw this up on a graph, right? So if I were to have a graph like this, where I've got time on the x-axis, and we've got millivolts, so a charge on the y-axis, I'm not going to give you any particular values here because it's different compared to different tissues. But let's just say right now, our resting membrane potential is sitting down here. And let's just say down here, it's negative, up here it's neutral, and up here it's positive. So right now, what we've got with this difference is that this difference is termed polarized, right? So as you can see, this charge difference has a term. It's called polarized. So let's now have a think. It's polarized and it's sitting here and nothing's happening. We also need to remember that for most of these tissue types, there are various thresholds. So if I were to just draw a line like this, as you can see, there is a place along this charge gradient where if the charge of the cell from inside to outside changed and hit this threshold, the threshold will trigger something. And generally the threshold is gonna trigger that excitable tissue to do its thing, all right? So right now it's at rest, nothing's happening. So as you can see, the threshold tends to be in the more positive than the resting membrane potential. Again, doesn't matter whether it's a neuron or a muscle in this case. So what can we see here? What could we do to make this hit the threshold to trigger it to do its thing? Well, let's have a think. We know that outside we've got most of our sodium, inside we've got most of our potassium, and outside we've also got most of our calcium as well. Now another thing you should realize is that outside we've got another thing. We've got most of our chloride. Where should I draw the chloride? Let's draw the chloride here. We've got most of our negative chloride. Now this is important. These are the major ions you need to keep in mind. If I were to open some sodium channels, so I'm going to take this charge difference and just show it down here, right? Negative inside, positive outside. So if I were to open a channel, for example, that was a sodium channel, what do you think is going to happen? Sodium is going to rush into the cell, down its concentration gradient. Now if sodium rushes into a channel down its gradient, bringing its positive charge with it, what do you think happens to this graph? it starts to move up in the positive. If enough positive sodium go inside that it hits the threshold, this then triggers this excitable tissue to do its function, right? So for example, this might be for a neuron to send a signal down its axon. For a muscle, it might trigger it to contract. Now have a think, sodium isn't the only positive ion that sits outside. We've got other positive ions outside like calcium. So if I were to show calcium and open a calcium channel, we're going to have calcium enter as well, carrying its positive charge with it. The same thing happens. If it's down here, right, it starts to drift up to the threshold. So the point I'm trying to get here is that if you open up 
positively charged ion channels where most of those ions are outside and you get positive ion called cation influx, that leads to the cell changing its charge. Now generally speaking, that threshold is the key to open a whole bunch of other channels that make it even more positive. So for example, if I were to let some sodium in, for example, and it, let's just say I let some sodium in and it, it was enough to hit that threshold, that threshold might be the key to open that calcium channel. Calcium's now open and all that calcium comes in and then you get it going up even more positive. What we've just done was we've gone from a polarized state where it was positive outside, negative inside to making it positive inside. This change is called depolarization. And the depolarization event is what coincides with the excitable tissue doing its function. So when an excitable tissue depolarizes, that is going to be synonymous with it performing its function. For neurons, the depolarization sends a signal down the axon. For muscle tissue, that depolarization will correspond with the fibers or fibrils inside, like the actin and myosin myofibrils, coming together to form crosslinks and contracting. That's really important. This is the primary way you can excite an excitable tissue. But I want you to have a think about something in this case, right? So let's just say the sodium and the calcium channels, they're closed. So there's no sodium and calcium getting inside of these channels. Close the lid, close the lid, nothing's happening. They're stuck outside. It's negative inside this cell compared to the outside that's positive, and we're just sitting at our resting membrane potential. All right, what if I really don't want this thing to fire off? What could I do? Well, anything that brings it further away from the threshold, so dropping it down here into the more negative, will make it less likely to be excitable. And how could we do that? Well, we need to make the inside more negative. Two major ways we can do that, right? We could throw more potassium out. So maybe we just open more potassium channels. If we open more potassium channels, more potassium leaks out. It drifts down into the more negative. What else could we do? We could open chloride channels. And if we were to open chloride channels, chloride's gonna come in, carrying its negative charge with it, making the inside even more negative. Anything that widens the distance between the charge inside and the threshold, well, that's gonna make it less likely to stimulate, less likely to be excitable and fire off a signal. And this is how neurons can work to stop signals. This is how some drugs can work to stop sending signals, for example. And this can happen with muscle tissue and nervous tissue. Now, finally, to finish with, we need to think about another tissue type, which sort of sits under the banner of epithelial tissue, and this is what we call endocrine tissue. Now endocrine tissue, this is tissue that can release chemicals that we call hormones into the bloodstream. An argument could be made that endocrine tissue is also excitable, and it can work similarly to this. I'll give you one quick example as to how this is the case. All right, so if we've got, let's just say this cell here is a pancreatic, pancreatic beta cell. Do you know what that means, pancreatic beta cell? Pancreatic beta cell are the cells within the pancreas that make insulin. We need insulin released into the bloodstream so that tissues like our liver, uh, so tissues like our muscle and our um, fat cells can take glucose in. So imagine that this is not a neuron, this is not a muscle, but this is a pancreatic beta cell. All of this, this is what's happening, right? Let's get rid of this calcium channel here. But the sodium potassium, that's working. The potassium efflux, so the leaky channel, that's working. And we've got a resting membrane potential in this beta cell, just like this. Now here's the thing with this beta cell, we've got insulin present, right? Insulin's made and it's sitting within these little vesicles that we want to release. We want to release this insulin out of the beta cell into the bloodstream. How do we do it? Well, let's take a look. First thing we need to understand is we have glucose. We eat food, our blood glucose levels go up. Glucose will bind to glucose receptors, which will then allow for the glucose to enter the cell. That glucose, through various enzymatic reactions, will undergo glycolysis, 
and will ultimately turn into something called pyruvate, which will then turn into acetyl-CoA, and that will enter the mitochondria. And in the mitochondria, it undergoes the Krebs cycle, it undergoes a whole bunch of stuff, and what it ultimately will produce is ATP. It takes ADP and produces ATP. All right. That's the role of glucose in this case, to produce ATP. But I want you to think about this. There is a potassium channel, right, present in this beta cell. And this potassium channel has a lid. Now, in actual fact, if we were to draw it up like this, it's inside like that, right? Now, if you've got no glucose entering, you've got low ATP and you've got high ADP, right? Because no glucose means you're not making ATP. So the ADP, ADP remains high. And when ADP remains high, what it does is that the ADP sits on this lid and keeps it open. And that allows for potassium to leave the cell, making it more negative inside the cell, which means it makes it less likely right, for this cell to be excited. When the cell gets excited, it releases insulin. But here, it's not getting excited. No glucose means no ATP, which means high ADP, sits open, it is less excitable. However, when ATP is made, because we have thrown glucose in to turn into pyruvate, to turn into acetyl-CoA, to enter the Krebs cycle, to undergo this process, and we start producing large amounts of ATP, and low ADP, while the ADP disappears, the lid closes, ATP sits on that lid, keeping it shut. What do you think this means? It means the potassium remains inside, right? Making it more positive. And if it becomes positive enough that it hits the threshold, this then opens calcium channels. And calcium channel lids will fly in and calcium will enter the beta cell. We know that calcium in neurons, right, when calcium enters neurons right at the end of the neurons, towards the synapses, it stimulates the release of vesicles that contain neurotransmitters. Similar thing happening in this case. This will then travel to the membrane and it will release insulin into the bloodstream. So you can make an argument that in this case, endocrine tissue is excitable tissue. All right, I'm gonna leave that there. This is a quick 101 and introduction to excitable tissue. Hi everyone, Dr. Mike here. If you enjoyed this video, please hit like and subscribe. We've got hundreds of others just like this. If you wanna contact us, please do so on social media. We are on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Dr. Mike Todorovic, at D-R-M-I-K-E-T-O-D-O-R-O-V-I-C. Speak to you soon.